I am Kathleen Higgins, the founder of Sea Change Conversations, an organization that was founded to generate nonpartisan conversation and understanding around the issue of climate change. Today's topic is the unique and critical role that businesses have to play in addressing this issue. With me today is our guest, Andrew Winston. Andrew, welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me. Andrew is a globally recognized author and consultant who works with companies around the world mm -hmm. to prepare for, navigate through, and mm -hmm. potentially even profit from some of the greatest challenges to humanity. That's right. That sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds big. <laughs> so Andrew, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did sure. you get started in helping others face these challenges? Well, um, I went to Princeton, I should probably mention. That was uh, you know, where my career started. Came out of here in 91. Uh, I worked in business first. I was um, in the business world for over a decade. I worked for Boston Consulting Group and then was in big media companies doing strategy and marketing and biz dev. And I wasn't in sustainability. I didn't really know much about it. And um, I had kind of a value shift where I wanted to you know, marry my business background with just concern about where the world was going and, and use of resources and kind of always had this practical view of um, what people call sustainability, um, which is you know, how are we using the world? How are we using resources? Are we uh, building a thriving future? And so you know, I got into this by going back to school and, and getting a degree in environmental management and started writing books about companies and how they approach big environmental and social issues. And, and climate change is really you know, the core biggest issue. And so I've been, you know, for the last 15 years, working with large companies, doing a lot of speaking, writing. I write regularly for Harvard Business Review and put out books and just trying to uh, give executives and companies the tools and frameworks and ideas for how to think about their businesses differently and create value in a different way, where sustainability is kind of at the core. And things like climate change are threats, but also opportunities to uh, build your business in a different way. So how do businesses see climate change? Is there a difference across sector? Do big companies see it differently than little companies? Yeah. Well, it's actually, I think, shifted pretty dramatically in the last five or so years. I think as it has in any survey of, you know, around climate change in the po general populace, um, there was a lot of skepticism about talking about climate change in business when I first got into this. Uh, but I would say in the last few years, the, the level of denial or, or saying, hey, this isn't an issue for us, has dropped to near zero in the world's largest companies. I mean, every, pretty much every large company in the world now has a sustainability report, has concrete goals that they've put forward. Uh, and I work with companies a lot on their goal setting. And they have goals for carbon and for energy. So there's no denial. I mean, uh, as, as you know, we've talked about you know, Exxon, Shell, all the big oil companies have um, a statement that they believe in climate change and think we should do something. Um, but of course, it, you know, it varies by sector, right? The clean economy or people, you know, companies that are making money by providing solutions, which is a lot of things. It's not just a Tesla, but it could be uh, a company like Ingersoll Rand that makes heating and cooling systems and they make them more efficient. They make them with refrigerants that are lower greenhouse gas. That's all climate solutions, you know, companies doing building systems, transportation systems. So there's a huge range of companies that fall into uh, the climate solution realm. But for others, obviously, it's a big threat. You know, oil and gas, heavily energy intensive businesses, you know, the move away from carbon that really the world has to pursue for our own safety um, and, you know, providing for a future for eight, nine, 10 billion people means that some sectors are going to have to shrink. And so the kind of attitudes about it really do vary. But most companies now see that it's affecting their business directly and that there's tremendous value in slashing their emissions, buying renewable energy, talking to their customers about it, showing their employees that they are dealing with it. All of that is really good for their business. So you mentioned employees and yeah. customers. What role do people have in helping this transition go forward? Well, look, I mean, when you talk to you know, top executives um, or a CEO, they care fundamentally about a few stakeholders. Investors, clearly, that's who they're meeting with all the time. But employees and customers, those are the two that really um, matter, right? They, and, and there's been this swing, a very clear swing, in employees demanding more and more of their companies. And it's partly generational. The millennials are now about half the workforce um, because they're not kids anymore. The older millennials are approaching 40. Uh, and the Gen Z generation is coming into the workforce as well. And there's plenty of evidence and surveys showing that these generations have a different view of business and think, um, a large majority think that you know, the financial bottom line is not the only thing they should be thinking about, that their, their role in society, their values, 
you know, serving uh, the environment, serving humanity, are part of what makes a company successful. So, you know, executives are hearing that. So employees have, a, I think, a very big role. And when I hear even skeptical kind of companies, they do believe their employees care, and that really drives them. And then, of course, you know, consumers and, and customers, you know, business to business customers, they matter. Where are they putting their dollars? What, the, what are the choices they're making? And you see markets shifting. You know, there's a shift, particularly in the food arena, to much more sustainable products um, that's driven by consumer demand. And there's a rising um, interest from consumers to know more about every product, know what's in it. And it's called the clean label movement often. They want to know what's in it. They want to know the footprint of it, how much carbon, how much water, who made it, where they paid a living wage. You know, we want that information about products now, and that's driving, I think, a lot of change in business. So uh, yes, I mean, consumers and employees, we we have a role, if all of us, in how we choose to spend our dollars and who we work for and what we demand of our employers. All of that creates important pressure. But what about investors? We didn't talk about them. Yeah. Clearly, there's a lot of movement to ESG. Are you seeing it? providing that impetus to push companies in the right direction? Well, I, you know, I'd say of all the stakeholders, investors on some level have always been the laggard on this. It, it, you know, sustainability has been viewed, I think, mostly incorrectly as somehow anti-business, somehow a cost center. So for the investors, it seems like it, it takes away. Um, you know, for example, when GE launched Ecomagination like 11, 12 years ago, uh, more actually, 13 or 14, um, they got hit by the marketplace. Like the investors thought this was ridiculous. They were going to go focus on more environmentally sound products. That was going to take them away from core. That's changed. You, you don't see companies getting hit for that as much. Um, and there's been this big shift in the institutional investors. That group, clearly, the really long-term investors like pension funds, sovereign funds, um, big index funds like um, BlackRock and Vanguard, have clearly pushed companies to think more about purpose, about environmental, social, and governance. Um, and they've made that very clear that this has to be part of their thinking. I think the analyst side of the financial world has still not moved very much. And, and I hear from CEOs, CFOs, investor relations, most of those analyst conversations every quarter, they're still the same conversation. They're not really asking about sustainability. I think we're starting to see some shift in that, but it's still kind of lagging. Um, but what we are seeing is banks starting to launch uh, different funds, you know, their own products, investment funds focused on more sustainable companies. And that's because they're feeling pressure from customers, mainly from what I've seen, private wealth, you know, wealthy individuals and the younger members of those families, the millennials again, pushing for more options for impact investing to see their money go to good. So that's starting to shift the thinking, I think, in the finance world. So we're hearing a lot about other parts of the world where central banks are taking a primary role in trying to force through greater care and analysis of how climate change will impact mm -hmm. institutions' viability. That's just beginning in our yeah. country. Are you seeing any kind of momentum around that? Uh, well, certainly you've seen um, Mark Carney in the UK, who's you know the Bank of England, has been incredibly vocal, and he launched with Michael Bloomberg here um, this TCFD, this Task Force on Climate Disclosure. They, they launched a, a program and developed um, guidance for companies on how to talk about climate as a risk and possible opportunity for their business in the way they talk in 10, 10Ks and in their annual reports about material issues. And that is something companies are adopting, this, this set of guidelines on how to talk about climate. So you're, you are seeing some of these central bankers and these big voices Again, the ones who think about systemic risk. If you're a central banker, you're thinking about the economy-wide risk, and they're getting that climate is becoming just a risk to humanity and a risk to the economy. Um, I, I don't know if we're seeing it as much in the U.S. I think you know, uh, you know, we're not at a place where the Fed is really worried about this too much. Um, but I think it will become a bigger issue. As I said, the institutional investors, maybe at the state level, uh, certainly are asking more and more questions. So it's, it's shifting. It is, it is beginning. So it seems as if the market hasn't yet really factored in the full risk of climate change. Um, it's been noted that a bond yeah. from Miami is probably rated the same as one from Charlotte, which yeah. has much less risk. How can investors protect themselves mm. when it's not transparent at this time? That's a really interesting question. I think, I think the bond issue, it, it could shift. I know Moody's has, has put out public statements saying um, cities need to have kind of climate and resilience plans and they will change their, they could change their ratings. They've said some of this to companies in private as well. Um, but it's true, we're not really pricing in just yet. Um, 
I think it's like it's hard for investors to know where the risks are, but I think you're going to see you know some kind of natural shift in where assets go, where investment is. I think you know property values in Miami Beach are going to start to fall as people think the future is going to be difficult for them. And so you'll see it in certain markets like real estate. I think they'll natural naturally be pricing, and part of that will be built in because the insurance companies. You know they have a big role in what what assets are valuable. If they they're they're not going to um, insure some of these properties anymore, which right. makes them much less valuable. So I, I think we'll see it in kind of these uh, different ways as as these different players like insurance companies and reinsurers start to change kind of the the dynamics of what they'll insure. That affects kind of the values of assets. But you're right, it's not particularly priced in. I think this is why you know something like a price on carbon is so critical. Um, to moving the economy and moving the, the world at a fast enough pace because then you start to price it into everything. Carbon intensive things cost more. Cleaner things cost less. That's how you, you know, start to have a, a sense of where you should be putting your money. Right. And the yeah. price on carbon has been really championed by economists around the world. Yeah. But the question is how high should that price be? Yeah. Uh, I think the World Bank suggested it should be at $75 per ton. Do you see that happening um, in our country? Look, I, I think it's there's no country that's done anything that high yet. And well, Sweden, I think, is somewhere in the hundred dollar range, mm -hmm. and they built it over time. I think you you need to put something in place and have a very clear, transparent plan for accelerating it. And there's always this concern of oh, if it gets to a hundred dollars, it'll cost so much. Well, no. The point of that is that you move away from the things that get taxed. So you're so nobody's paying the hundred dollars at that point, right? Like you you've shifted your grid, you've shifted your cars and your you know infrastructure because of those, those amounts. Um, I don't know if it'll happen in the US, but there are countries all over the world and there's regions and states within North America that have been doing this. British Columbia has a price on carbon. There's you know, trading schemes among states and subnational mm -hmm. players. China's got a price in, in parts of their economy. So it's growing in different places. The number does have to be high. I mean, let's, let's be honest. The, the, the social cost of carbon that people use is something like 75, 100. That really encapsulates all the damage it does to our health and to our future ability to thrive. So it would need to be high, but you don't do that immediately. You start it and you ramp it up. But the longer we wait, the closer we get to some of these kind of deadline dates on how much carbon we need to cut from the world, the faster we're going to have to go and the more painful it's going to be. Right? So we've been delaying so long that the, the, the timeline's getting more and more accelerated. So the, that argument of it's too expensive to deal with now, keep the economy strong and let future generations handle it, yeah. seems to be losing some steam as the yeah. evidence is more clear around us. It, it seems as if there's a lot of discussion now about the cost of inaction. Yeah. As you talk about these social costs, the greater chances of these natural disasters is indeed getting to be much greater than the cost of action. Right. Are companies recognizing this as well? Yeah, I think they, they are starting to realize that because they're getting hit directly. And it is true. I mean, there's been this statement that it's, it's going to destroy the economy to do something on climate or to price carbon. And really, it's very clear what's going to destroy economies is doing nothing and it getting worse. And there's been banks. This isn't statements from Greenpeace. You know, Citibank did a, mm -hmm. a report you know, four or five years ago that laid out the cost to the economy, tens of trillions if we don't tackle carbon, the cost of moving towards a clean economy. And it was actually cheaper to do a clean economy than a, than a dirty economy, which means the payoff was actually infinite. It was cheaper to then save the tens of trillions. I mean, I remember my math and e economics from Princeton. If you have a zero in the denominator, it's, you know, it's an infinite return. But anyways, I think companies are seeing this. They're feeling the pain. Uh, AT&T is a good example where they put out um, an estimate of, I think, $870 million that they spent um, related to extreme weather over the last few years. Mm -hmm. That's assets being hit by storms, floods, whatever. And so they set out with Argonne Laboratories. Um, they went and got some really smart guys on the outside and said, let's map out what we think sea level will look like in 30 years under different scenarios. They, f they kind of leaned in and focused in on like southeast, um, the south southeastern states. And they mapped out, for example, like in Savannah, Georgia, if sea level's this high, and they map their assets, their cell towers, their wires. A lot of them will be underwater, right? So this is a very real cost for them that they're laying out and getting prepared for, and they're already feeling it. So I think, yes, companies are starting to realize that this is getting very expensive. Um, and so the idea that it will be too expensive to do something is becoming kind of ridiculous. 
So let's drill down on some of the threats that your clients around the country yeah. or around the world are seeing. Clearly, you mentioned physical threats, but it's yeah. not just sea level rise. What are some of the other ones that companies are preparing for? Well, I think the, I think a lot of the risk that they worry about are certainly to assets, right? And um, and that's not just floods; that's just storms, droughts. I think water issues, water shortages are a, a deep concern. So you see companies um, setting goals and and taking action to understand where their assets and offices overlap with water stressed regions and what that means and especially businesses like beverage companies that rely yeah, on water right. literally okay. for their product um, there's risk in the supply chain often a company can say okay we're not in water stressed areas but then you start looking at key supply chain um, steps or, or points in their supply chain there was a kind of famous moment when there was big floods in, in Thailand um, a few years back and the two industries um, discovered that they had a couple key components that that was basically where the only place they made them. It was hard drives and some of the automakers and they lost hundreds of millions of dollars because part of getting lean and efficient over all these years has been like you you almost like it's like monoculture in, in um, agriculture. You do this in your supply chain. One place makes everything cheap but if that place gets flooded or, or droughted or whatever your whole business shuts down for a while. So it, it isn't just the floods, it is the droughts, it's hurricanes. Um, and a lot of companies are concerned and looking at the effects on their employees and communities and what happens in these places where there's, you know, huge shutdowns of power and, f and fires and floods. So it, it, it's just, it's like all extreme weather, right? And it creates enormous risk for their operations, for stores being shut down because everybody's got to get off the road or get, has to evacuate an area that just kills business. So it's all of it. I think it's every kind of extreme weather you can imagine is, is on the radar now. So we often talk about the physical risks, but it seems like there's also this reputational risk, which we touched on a bit. Yeah. Um, it seems like there's perhaps more pressure abroad where there's things like flight shame for yeah, people yeah. who take a flight. Are we seeing a little more of that here? Uh, I think we may not have flight shame quite as much, but there is, there is clearly um, something happening where companies you know, are feeling the need to talk about their purpose. Wait, I mean, almost every CEO, big companies, we have a purpose and mm -hmm. talking about sustainability. And if you saw a few months back where the business round table put out their big statement with the 200 CEOs of the, basically the fortune 200 and said, we're not just about shareholder primacy. We're about stakeholders to be cynical. They must see the benefit or the need to say that it can't just be because they feel like, you know, saying how great customers are. It, they're feeling that pressure. Right. And so there is, Reputational risk is, uh, as I mentioned before, it's not just you know uh, your brand in the marketplace. It's reputational risk amongst amongst potential and current employees. I think that the the attraction and retention of talent is such a big deal in so many sectors that you need a good reputation as a company that someone wants to work for. And yes, and, you know, as a brand for a company to buy from, that of course always matters. And and something that's that I think. You can talk about intangible value in business, and it sounds so foofy, you know, so soft. But um, something has shifted dramatically over the last 40, 50 years that the amount of like the S and P 500 kind of market cap that's physical assets, that's kind of measurable assets. 40 years ago was like 80 percent of the market cap. Now it's like 20 percent, meaning 80 percent is intangible, is brand, mm -hmm. is intellectual property, is lo is your employee loyalty. It's all these other things. So actually, managing that is a pretty big deal. And, and sustainability and managing against climate change goals is a big part of managing that brand and intangible value. So we have heard that this is a collective danger and that we have to act collectively mm -hmm. in order to solve it. Yet on our national level, we're becoming more fragmented perhaps than ever. Yeah. Do you see a special role for businesses, especially multinational businesses, to help create some sort of um, coordinated effort yeah. to lessen the risk. Yeah, I mean, we have to come together. This is a problem for all 7.7 .7 billion of us. Um, and yes, we're in this really historic swing towards kind of every person for themselves, isolationism, nationalism, populism. It's timed really badly for something like climate change where we do need collective action. I think companies have a really unique role because they are the biggest ones are they're called multinationals most most people just refer to them as multinationals now because they're literally multinational right american based companies uh, most of them they get more of their revenue abroad now so they have employees 
all over the world. They, within their brand, their tribe of their company, they have people from all over the world. So there's, there is kind of this connection. Um, and, and our economies are so linked, you know, that it, it is the economic driver and the business driver, I think, is a way to come together. And, co and companies have kind of a convening power to bring together, say, their whole value chain, get their suppliers together and talk about a big issue, a big problem. And you see more and more of that happening, these what they call pre-competitive um, kind of gatherings or, or you know, um, collaborations. So they're working on maybe a big issue in their sector, in their, in their business that has some ramifications like plastics right now. Everybody's worried about plastics. You see companies coming together, figuring out packaging, how can we keep it out of the ocean? Um, and so I think they have a convening power that's, that's a little different than the governments right now and kind of go around um, governments and, and work at all levels, at the state level, sub-national, you know, at regions within countries. They can, they can kind of work everywhere. Um, it's, it, it's been kind of one of those fun factoids that like Coca-Cola has like more distribution in like Africa than any, any hmm. governments, right? Like they can get things to anywhere because they can get a Coke to every, every town in Africa. You know, so there, there's, there's actual infrastructure these companies have that they can reach out to the whole world. So it's, I think it's an incredible opportunity. So we have this opportunity and they have this concern. Why aren't they raising their voices more on a policy basis? Why aren't they lobbying our government to do more? Yeah, it's it's an important question and it's come up lately. In in my book, The Big Pivot, I, you know, said become a climate lobbyist and it was um, not something companies were comfortable with and they're still not a few years later. But it's becoming a topic and, and it's something I'm writing about a lot more. Uh, there was an initiative that launched um, few, just a few weeks ago where 11 big NGOs came together and called on companies to harmonize their policy with their statements about climate while they're meanwhile maybe lobbying against some policies or their trade associations or you know trade groups or or are you know or their associations of their business are lobbying against these things and so it is a big gap and i think you know one of the mega trends is transparency and i think we know more and more there's a group called influencer um, influencermap.org and they track companies and they're lobbying and they're donating so we can get more information now about the inconsistencies and I think again employees will find that less and less um, acceptable and mm -hmm. and they're calling out their CEOs about it um, 8,000 employees at Amazon wrote an open letter on medium saying hey Jeff Bezos we need a climate policy and you got to stop you know trying to build more and more business with the oil and gas industry and you know fighting regulation like they called them out on all this stuff. So I, I think companies are going to be asked more and more questions about their lobbying. And they've been hesitant on climate for a lot of very complicated reasons. I think it's become a kind of political football where they feel like somehow they're siding with one party if they're pro-climate. But companies have been not reticent about chiming in on topics I would have thought were much tougher, like trans bathroom bills in states, LGBT rights in general, immigration, gun control. You got companies coming out and pushing for policy, changing their own policies on very contentious issues. So why not climate? Why can't they make that jump? So as you look at this landscape, and obviously you're going around the world, what is it that you're most concerned about? What worries so you at many night? Things. Yeah, people ask me that. What keeps <laughs> me up at night? Um, look, there's a couple dimensions to it. There's just the physical reality of climate change that's hard not to be worried about and hard not to be... Uh, frankly sad about there's this idea of climate grief that people are dealing with I've written about it um, it's hard because I actually think that the evidence is pretty clear and the science is clear and there's a lot of inertia in our physical systems there's damage coming very big damage we're already seeing some of it Venice is flooded this week um, I grew up in South Florida I think the odds that Miami is is fully inhabitable in 30 years is low um, I think we're gonna lose regions. We're going to lose the coral. It looks like the coral is mostly going to die, which is an important ecosystem. We're losing species. So there's stuff that just keeps me up because we're going to lose parts of our kind of rich environment, our rich world. Um, but I, I do think we're going to make it. We're going to kind of come back. We're going to, we're going to stop some of that damage as fast as we can. But it does worry me this inability to collaborate, this, um, this isolationism that we feel not just country to country, but within our, you know, within our country in particular, there's these kind of bubbles that, that we're all in and we're not communicating when well, this really is a, a very collaborative issue that we have to deal with. It, 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 it's, what make, it's what makes climate change the hardest issue I think humanity's ever faced because it is 
if you were going to design something, given our psychology, to make it difficult to tackle, you would, it would be climate change. It's, it's long term. You can't see it physically a lot of the time. It's invisible. You know, it's, respo it's a responsibility of everybody. All of us have a role. Um, it's very different than like the ozone problem, where there were like five companies that made these chemicals. You could fix that. You could help fix the ozone. This is everybody. And so that worries me that it's so diffuse, it's so hard, um, that it's, it's going to be difficult to kind of go as fast as, as we need to. So we'll counter that with okay. asking you, what gives you the greatest hope? So there's two things that give me a lot of hope. Um, one is the rise of the clean economy. The, the reduction in the cost of, of clean technologies of all kinds, you know, solar, wind, batteries, building systems, AI that helps make things more efficient, they've gotten radically cheaper, faster than people expected over the last decade. I think solar and wind are down 70 to 90 percent. They're now fundamentally cheaper. Um, there's a study every year from Lazard, a bank that they analyze what it costs to build different forms of energy. And in essence, solar and wind are now cheaper, so unsubsidized, almost everywhere. And we're getting to the, a point in the next couple of years where building new solar and wind will be cheaper than running existing coal and nuclear. The marginal cost of running a coal plant will be more than building a new solar, which means we're going to start shutting down some old assets. That gives me a lot of hope. Um, and I bought a new uh, electric vehicle recently, and it's like the best car I've ever owned. Like, the products are great. Alternative meat and protein. Like, there's just better sustainable products now than ever. And they're working, and people love them. The other thing that gives me a lot of hope is the youth movement. Um, it's hard not to be inspired by Greta Thunberg. She was a kid with a sign at 15, sitting in front of her school alone. A year later, not even a year, four or five months later, she's speaking to the World Economic Forum and the, and the you know, UN and the UK Parliament and telling them they're ruining her future and they're not doing enough and she's going to have to take over. It's, it's incredible. And, and I think you have to be excited about that level of engagement. Um, and they don't seem to be going away. You know, they've, mm -hmm. it seems something different in Gen Z. These teens, um, they see a problem and they're like, we're not just going to accept it. We're going to go demand action. And by the way, all of those kids become voters pretty soon. Like if they're 16 or 17, it's not long till they're voting. A lot of them are voting in the next election. So we'll see how much they translate that to action. But that gives me, has to give you hope. You know, they're so engaged. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for ending on that. We are so enjoyed learning from you here today. And for those of you who would like to learn more about what Andrew is telling companies around the world, please take a look at his website and see his TED Talks and go out and buy his book, The Big Pivot. Great. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.